Good morning, church family. We're glad to have you as we are gathered once again this day to worship our Lord together. At the end of Daniel chapter 4, King Nebuchadnezzar, the king of the Chaldeans, says this after having been humbled by God. His dominion is an everlasting dominion, and his kingdom endures from generation to generation. All the inhabitants of the earth are accounted as nothing, and he does according to his will among the hosts of heaven and among the inhabitants of the earth. And none can stay his hand or say to him, what have you done? And this is a reminder that our God is always reigning over the nations. Even as the nations rage and there are wars that happen that we cannot control, we are reminded that our God is in control and that he is working out his purposes in the midst of the conflicts that we see around us. So as we begin our time, let's stand and praise our God who is the Ancient of Days. Thank you.
morning. Welcome to worship with us today. We're grateful for the opportunity to gather together and worship our Lord as we begin to worship today. We have a few announcements we want you to be aware of and a few elders to bring you those announcements. In the moment, Del Banner will provide us an announcement for missions. But before we do, Art Kinzinger, our elder chairman, is here to provide us another announcement. Well, good morning, and I would like to take a minute to visit with you about our church ministries. In 2020, March 15th, that was our last um, public worship. The doors were closed because of governor's mandates, and we remained closed until uh, June 7th. At June 7th, we re opened the doors to the public worship, but we had two services trying to minimize the size of the crowd. We spread the rows apart, spread the chairs apart, and we have continued to offer two services until right through the present. And I want to draw your attention to and express the appreciation that we as elders and deacons, in fact, the whole church have to our pastors and staff for the Herculean effort they have made to provide double worship services for everyone. They have gone above the call of duty. Amen. That being said, COVID has impacted our Sunday school ministries and we would like to begin to rebuild those ministries the mandates are gone, and so therefore uh, we have decided as elders that J April 3rd we will no longer offer a 9 o'clock worship service. We will all be meeting at the 1030 hour. I know that may inconvenience some, and uh, you know I feel badly about that, but uh, it's time to move on, and the goal is to re-energize the education ministries that we once had and so i appreciate that you have attended throughout the covid period i appreciate your uh, faithful giving and your prayers for this ministry and uh, i look forward to being back together thank you Good morning. Uh, periodically, the uh, GO team, used to call it the Missions Committee, now it's the GO team, that stands for Global Outreach uh, Team. Uh, periodically, we bring an update. Well, this is an update of something that we could have announced about nine or ten months ago, but I don't know whether it's due to COVID or whatever else, but here we are today, and I want to share with you something I hope you'll find exciting. Um, that's new in the church. Um, as exciting as giving money can be, um, that's the subject, missions and money. We have now at the church created something called the Go Fund. So you may have gotten an envelope or you may have, maybe you do your giving online and you look at the menu of places where your giving can be directed and you find this reference to GoFund. It's been there for a number of months. <clears throat> this is our first chance to really share about what that is. So um, that's my purpose today. Um, it's a new option for giving in support of missions. Now, <clears throat> at this point, before I go any further, if you're with me, you may be thinking, don't we have a significant section of the operating budget of the church that's devoted to missions? Yeah, we do. It really is about $97,000 that we commit every month to monthly obligations to the missionaries, the GO partners, that is to say, that we have around, uh, around the world that we support. Uh, so... What I'm describing here is the GoFund that does not replace 
that line item in our budget, but it gives us an opportunity to supplement that regular giving to support our missionaries uh, around the world. You know, the Lord directed us to go into all the nations. Well, I don't know that we're supporting folks in all the nations, but we are supporting folks in at least 20 other nations. That is to say, they're directly in place in those other 20 nations. Um, and some of them that we support, support, they're involved with ministries that reach far beyond that. Um, there's about 40, not quite actually, I think that at the moment it's 38. Sometimes it gets up as high as 50. It's a bit of a floating number as people go to and from the field. Uh, uh, anyway, uh, that's what we're doing. Now, one way of thinking about this is down here in the bottom, I've tried to uh, uh, show our existing uh, commitments. That's ongoing commitments that we have right now to 38 GO partners in 20 nations. Those are um, planned and budgeted amounts. In addition, we support another eight or 10 parachurch ministries. Altogether, we write checks every month for either side of $8,000 uh, <clears> to those people. That's locked in, that's budgeted, that, that provides for getting missionaries to the field, to supporting and sustaining them physically, uh, roof and food and travel budget uh, to the extent it can be budgeted, uh, and uh, the program needs where they are. But then, I don't know, well, I, I told the first service, you know, in two weeks we're going to have um, a missions emphasis Sunday. Mark your calendars, please, two weeks from today. You'll have a chance to visit face-to-face -face with some of these people, those 38 people that'll be here. One thing you'll take away from that encounter is that they'll remind you a lot of people. They're a lot like other people. They have surprises in their families, in their lives, things that come along. What if you're in, you know, Mauritania or Tanzania or... Uh, uh, India, and you rely on a car, and the car quits. What do you do? Well, that wasn't in the budget. Um, you know, you or I, that ha would happen in years or my uh, lives. We might work a little extra. We might take another job. We might borrow some money to go get a heart. That really doesn't work for a missionary in the field uh, in a third world country. They have to do deal with that. Um, what if their visa runs out and they have to leave the country unexpectedly and stay out for a while and come back? That's costly. What if the kids, you know, kids bring surprises. I don't know whether any of the rest of your kids bring surprises to your lives. That happens in missionary families in third world country and it imposes expenses. Then you get COVID and you can't get back into the country or you can't get out. What if you have a mission opportunity that comes along that you never dreamed of and you want to seize it? It takes some money to do that. Or what if there's an opportunity to take, get Bibles where you never were able before and you, you need to buy a bunch of Bibles? What can you do? Well, that's not an ordinary budget, budgeted plan that we've got down here. So the Go Fund is a way that we've tried to set in place a fund from which we can respond to these needs of our GO partners. We're partnering with these people on the, around the world. That means we ought to be there with them when they have surprises come along in their lives just as there are surprises in our own. So it's a new way to give to uh, these special needs and uh, to help cover some of the expenses. Some of these folks like coming next weekend We'll pay, some, pay them an honorarium. We'll help them with some of their expenses and other projects and, and, and special mission needs, information, and education. Here, those can be covered from the GoFund. And just so you uh, know, uh, in the past nine months since we've had a GoFund, this is what we've spent this money on. $500 for medical expenses. A couple uh, was in a bad uh, situation. We had an opportunity to get Bibles into Africa to a place where they hadn't been. We gave $1,500 for that. $3,000 to buy some land to build a soccer field for the school uh, that we're supporting um, in Africa. 
uh, $1,500 for Bible research software uh, for pastors in Haiti, uh, $1,000 for, for a couple uh, that have been on the field for a long time. They've been longtime partners. So they're just exhausted and burned out with the security problems, the COVID problems, the visa problems, the family problems. They needed to get out and chill. We gave them $1,000. That's what GoFund is there to do. Um, just so you know, again, memorial gifts to missions will add to the GoFund. Um, it's administered by the Go team. If we undertake a project uh, of more than $1,000, then we run that to the elders with the recommendation of the Go team. Uh, now, don't divert your money away from the general fund. We still got to support these people uh, on the field and their regular ongoing budget. And we need to keep the lights going on uh, here in the church, too. <clears throat> so if you want to help with these special needs, the GoFund is there um, for your giving. I hope you find that exciting. I, I, I do. I think it's a, a, a good addition to our church. Uh, you got questions, talk to a GO team minister, or a member. Minister, yeah, that's good. Thank you. Thank you, Dell. We are excited for the GO Fund and ways that we can participate in missions here in our church and around the world. One of those ways is also through short term mission trips. And we have one coming up this summer that Lori Patton is leading. Our a somewhat annual Copper Island trip, and she is going to be available after the worship service next week and on the 20th to answer questions, provide some information about those trips. So that'll be the 13th and the 20th in the library after the second service. Now, would the ushers come forward as we prepare to receive the offering? And before we do, please join me as we pray together. God, as we gather together as brothers and sisters in Christ, we remember our brothers and sisters all over the world who are doing the same, worshiping you in spirit and in truth. May the whole earth worship you, all the nations obey you, and all tongues confess your name. And people everywhere love and serve you in peace. As we worship, may we be strengthened and encouraged in our faith by one another and through your Spirit, that when trials of our lives come, we may be rooted and grounded in the hope that is ours in Christ. In all we do, may you make our love for each other and for others increase and overflow for your name's sake and to your glory. All these things we ask in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit. Amen. As we continue our time together singing to our Lord. Oh 
life he bled and died, Christ will hold me fast. Justice has been satisfied, he will hold me fast. Raised with him to endless life, he will hold me fast till our faith is turned. Heavenly Father, we, uh, we thank you that you do hold us. We need held by your grace. We need held by your faithfulness. We need held by your promises and your love. Even, Father, you hold to us in our rebellion. Thank you for the hope that comes knowing the height and depth and breadth of the love of Christ and that nothing can separate us from that love. We pray for folks who need today to know that they are being held fast by that grace. Perhaps some of our GO partners that find themselves serving in very difficult places with very little result feeling themselves to be failures in the work that you have called them to do. May they be held fast by your grace today. We think of people who are suffering, hearts broken, circumstances around them devastating, we pray that they would be held fast by your grace and your mercy. Father, we can't help but think of our brothers and sisters in Christ in the Ukraine who love you, worship you, and find themselves assaulted, displaced, grieving, confused, we pray that you would hold them fast. You have told us in your word to pray for the peace of the nations, for the prosperity of the gospel. We pray for that this day. We pray that you would stay the hand of Putin. We pray for mercy to be shown. Help us to do what we can do. Help us to do what we are called to do. Make your word become alive to us, please, by the power of the Spirit. Maybe a better prayer, make us to become alive to the life of your word, to be sensitive to what you're saying, open to how you're leading, willing to be transformed more and more into the likeness of Christ. We pray in the name of Jesus, amen. Thank you for allowing us, those of you who um, may not have noticed, Connie and I were gone for a few weeks. Uh, Connie was gone for three. I was gone for two. Uh, we, um, we were in Central Florida, 
And uh, we have gotten back and are grateful to be back. One of the things we did while we were in Florida is that we spent some time with Connie's oldest uh, but younger brother. She has, Connie's the oldest of five children. Uh, she has two other brothers, two other sisters, and the oldest brother, uh, which is 18 months uh, younger than Connie, uh, lives in Naples, Florida, down in the very southern part of Florida. But he has a summer home in Florida on near Lake Okeechobee. And so we met him at his getaway home, at his summer home in Florida. He drove up, we drove down, and we met him there. It's a fascinating place, uh, this summer home in which he lives. It's at the end of a long uh, road that is a dead-end road. As you're driving down this road toward their home, the right side as you drive down this road toward their home is the homes that face the grass runway, and they have hangers. On the left side of the road are the houses that face the Kissimmee River, and they have docks. The people on the right side of the road, they have hangers, they have planes. People on the left side of the road, they have docks, they have boats. Connie's brother is a boatman, so he has a dock. He told us about, and then we saw for ourselves, as we began our journey down that lane, to our left on the boat side of the street was the boat house. We didn't know when we heard that phrase, same thing you may be thinking, was it a community house? Was it a place with a lot of boats? What was the boat house? Well, picture in your mind a two-story home. The top story is living quarters. On either side, left and right, are other rooms that come all the way down to the ground. In the middle, it's open. And inside this opening of this large house was a very large, which appeared to me to be a very large, and it may have been, there was a time when people were making concrete. It may have been one of those boats, a concrete sailboat. It was fascinating to see. It was obviously a very sturdy boat because the boat held up the house. The house literally had settled to the point to where it was resting on the top of the boat. The occupants of that house, people continued to live there, knew that the house was in peril, so they went and got, I think there were four or five metal I-beams and bolted those to the left side of the house because that was the way the house was going and cemented them into the ground to hold the house up as it rested on the boat. Hence the name, the boathouse. It was unpainted. It was derelict. It was in risk of collapse, a shell of what it once was. It was deconstructing around its occupants. There's another form of deconstruction that is happening, and it seems to me that it is picking up pace. It is called deconstruction of faith. If you've never heard those two words tied together, bailing wired together, farmer put together, (laughs) deconstruction and faith, I guarantee you, if you have young adults with whom you're associated, maybe they're in college, maybe they are um, people who read, think about culture, they have heard the phrase deconstruction or deconstructing faith. Some statistics say as many as 60% of people who have sat where you are sitting today in conservative evangelical churches are deconstructing their faith. Well, look in your Bibles, please, 1 Thessalonians chapter number 3. First Thessalonians, that's where we have arrived, chapter number 3. One of the things you want to do, I want to do when we read the text, is to 
figure out what the author of the text intended to say. And I want to submit to you that as we read through chapter 3, it becomes apparent with Paul's repeated use of a particular word what the emphasis of the particular text is. So I'm going to read it out loud, and there is going to be a test at the end. So pay attention. You will be called upon. Ready? Therefore, Paul, writing to this church that he helped found, along with others, he had to hurry out of the city because of persecution and difficulty and hardship. He's been concerned about them. He sent Timothy back to check on them. Timothy has come back, reported to Paul what he found, told him about what's going on. They had some questions. This letter in 2 Thessalonians is written in response to what Timothy said and the questions the people in the church had. Therefore, when we could bear it no longer, Paul was anxious. You ever anxious? <laughs> I think this is a good anxiety. Faith does not mean that sometimes we are not anxious. Maybe we don't want to use the word anxious. Paul said, don't be anxious, but in everything give thanks. There are things we should not be anxious about. We ultimately can't control the future. Is Putin going to use nuclear weapons? I don't know. Maybe. But I refuse to be fearful about that because ultimately my days are in the hands of the Lord, and so are yours. I hope he doesn't. <laughs> don't be anxious. But that doesn't mean that faith means that we are uncaring, unconcerned, unmoved. Paul is concerned. He's deeply concerned. He's deeply moved. He's emotionally impacted. He's not stoical. Faith does not mean we're untouched, unmoved, uncaring about anything. We're in the zen of life. Um, we're zened out. We're zoned in. We're zoned out. Everything, we're not, nothing impacts us. That kind of stoicism is foreign to the idea of Scripture. Paul says, I'm, I'm concerned about you. That's why I sent Timothy. So much so we were willing to be left alone at Athens, he writes in verse 1, it costs me. Maybe Paul physically is not up to it. Maybe it's just very lonely being in a foreign city doing this difficult work. But he said, I'm willing to pay the price to encourage you. I'm willing to be inconvenienced for the sake of ministry. And so we sent Timothy in verse 2, our brother and God's co-worker, in the gospel of Christ to establish and exhort you in your faith that no one be moved by these afflictions. For you yourselves know that we are destined for this. Destined for what? Destined to suffer these afflictions. For when we were with you, we kept telling you over and over beforehand that we were to suffer affliction. And it's come to pass. And just as you know, we told you this happens, this was going to happen, now it has happened. But for this very reason, because you're experiencing these afflictions, when I could bear it no longer, I sent to learn about your faith for fear, Paul is fearful, anxious, that somehow the tempter had tempted you and all of our labor would be in vain. But now that Timothy has come to us from you, and has brought to us the gospel, same exact word, the gospel, the good news of your faith and love, and reported that you always remember us kindly, and that you long to see us just as we long to see you, for all the joy that we feel for your sake before our God, as we pray most earnestly night and day that we might see you face to face and supply what is lacking in your faith. Then there's this glorious benediction. Now may our God and Father himself and our Lord Jesus direct our way to you. May the Lord make you increase and abound in love for one another and for all as we do for you, so that he may establish your hearts blameless in holiness before our God and Father at the coming of our Lord Jesus with all of his saints. Here's the test. 
What is the emphasis of the text? What one word repeated throughout the text is the emphasis of the text? Faith. Five times in my translation. He repeats it over and over again. Paul talks about this whole idea of faith. And what he's concerned about, he tells us, is that they are not to be moved by their afflictions. What does he mean by that? Well, the word means, originally, when it was used originally, when we would have used the word, it would have been a word used to describe the wagon. And when you go home, uh, we here in the office hear a lot about Bingo. Bingo, the amazing super dog, best dog ever made. It's Bonnie and Randy's dog. And Bonnie and Randy are left for vacation. We're kind of tired about hearing about Bingo in the office. She's not here. She's probably listening But there's Bingo the dog, and when Bonnie comes in, Bingo the dog is glad to see her. Therefore, Bingo does what? Wags his tail. That was the word, to wag the tail. Well, how in the world did it get to the idea of a negative thing? Paul's concerned that it may be moved. It begins to mean someone who fawns over you, like a dog wagging its tail, For you, glad to see you. Then it began to mean something like somebody fawning over you, but having ulterior motives, fawning over you, talking to you in an effort to destabilize you. Paul's concern is that there are those surrounding these new believers in Thessalonica who follow him, and you read his epistles, and you see that happen repeatedly, who begin to say, you don't need to believe in Jesus. Or, as he says in Galatians, they preach another gospel or another Jesus. So Paul's concern is that they would deconstruct their faith, that they would move away from, that their faith would become derelict and begin to collapse around them, like the house near my brother-in-law's summer home. Well, I want to think about three ideas woven in that uh, and do that fairly quickly, but let's think about these three words. Number one, I want to think about faith. What is it? Number two, what do we mean when we talk about deconstructing our faith? And number three, what about apostasy? What about walking away from Jesus? Because that's what Paul's concerned about. He's worried, he's concerned, he's alarmed that these folks are just simply going to walk away from Jesus and walk away from their faith. Is that possible? Do people do that? What What do you say about that person? Are they a Christian or are they not? Well, let's think, first of all, about the idea of faith. To begin with, let's think about, let's, let's anchor in our heads a little bit what Paul is talking about five times here. Now, there are places in the Bible, for example, the book of Jude, that use the idea of faith to describe a, a doctrine. A, a, we have in our Constitution a statement of faith. That is an encapsulation, a summary of our faith. Let's use that way in the New Testament. That's not the way I don't think Paul is using it here. Here, Paul uh, describes this word. He, he begins all the way in chapter number one. He talks about the faith of the people of Thessalonica, and he says, I'm remembering before our God, Paul is a man of prayer. He says, oh, I'm thankful to the Lord in prayer for your work of faith, your labor of love, your steadfastness of hope. Paul connects. He says, I'm so thankful for your labor of faith, your work of faith. Now, we don't like to put those two words in the same box. It makes us nervous. Because what we're afraid of has come out of, comes out of the Scripture, but it really came out of the Reformation. It was emphasized, at least, a lot in the Reformation. Martin Luther, that we never want to confuse, we never want to amalgamate, we never want to weld together the ideas that somehow, some way, We can become Christians by doing enough. You know, if I give enough, if I'm baptized, if I join the church, if I give my money, if I give my money to the GoFund, if I come every Sunday, if I fill in the blank, then hopefully when I die, God will look at me and go, the good outweighs the bad, enter into the joy of the Lord. We're afraid 
of confusing the idea of salvation by works and not by grace. Well, Paul here describes, he begins to describe what he means by faith. He says that the word of the Lord has sounded forth uh, from you and has gone to all the world around you. He says, your faith in God has been talked about all over. What does he mean by that? What's he describing? What's been talked about? Well, he tells us. He said, first of all, the fact that you were so welcoming to us, to Paul and Timothy, the disciples, the apostles of Christ, So Paul is saying, you know, we were treated despicably. They were just before they arrived at that city, Thessalonica. They were at that city. They left. Paul says we were treated despicably, but he says we embrace the suffering because the master has said the servant's not greater than the master, and so we are persecuted as representatives of Jesus. Thanks, Jerry. Suffered because we identified, because we're so closely connected to Christ. And so we suffer persecution. But you gladly, publicly, enthusiastically identify with us. And in identifying with us, you're identifying with Jerry. Jesus. Thank you, brother. Paul says, the reception you gave us, The welcome you gave us is the welcome of the gospel. In fact, he's going to describe that, that they welcomed the gospel to the point to where they turned, repented, converted from idols, their hope, their meaning, their worship, all kinds of idols. We still have idols. We worship ourselves. We worship our reputations. We worship money. We worship sex. We worship all kinds of gods. It still exists. These folks turn from their idols to serve the living and true God. He would go on to say that they had responded in such a way that they received these words, the gospel, not as the word of men, but that which it truly is, as he says, the word of God, which is at work in you believers. With the result, Paul says, that you've become imitators of us, even as we become imitators, Jerry, of Jesus. So Paul says this, you know, why does all this, you know, pastors or preachers are renowned for never getting to the point. What's the point? Land the plane. The point's this, when we think about faith, I think there's a sense in which we have done faith in the New Testament a disservice. Because we have come to believe, we have come to see faith as something that happens to us at a point in time when we were becoming a Christian, a response to Jesus, but it has nothing to do with how we spend our money. It has nothing to do with how we treat our children. It has nothing to do with how we respond to the school board. It has nothing to do with how we deal with our boss at work. It has nothing to do with how we live our lives. That faith is simply a response in a positive way to Jesus, but it lies there. It's kind of like my way I respond to Abraham Lincoln. Abraham Lincoln was a great president, did a lot of great things, uh, worthy of respect and admiration. Watch the movie, Daniel Day-Lewis. I think it's the best movie about Lincoln. Maybe you could argue that. Daniel Day-Lewis's portrayal is moving of Lincoln. Watch it. We look at Lincoln. I think about Lincoln. I think about the the man, the character, all of those things that made up who he was. And there's a way in which he's influenced my life. But for some of us, that's the way Jesus is. He's a historical character. He had something, you know, to do back then. Uh, and I, I feel positive about him, and even to the point to where I'm willing to go to church and that sort of thing. But, but in terms of it really impacting my life, that faith is inert. I have a hand grenade. I grew up in a military home. 
my father's career military. And so I, I, as a kid, I was fascinated by all things military, all things Army, Air Force. I didn't like the Navy. Sorry if you were in the Navy. I don't know why. I didn't like the Navy. Probably because even by saying the word boat makes me want to throw up. I get violently seasick, violently seasick. I didn't like the Navy. I didn't understand the Marines. So there was the Air Force and the Army, and my dad let me buy a grenade at the Army surplus store. But the grenade I bought as a kid was what? Inert. It was hollow. It was empty. There was nothing in it. It would hurt you if you stood there and let me throw it and hit you in the head with it. But that was all the damage it would do. And for some of us, our faith is empty like that grenade. It's something that we have an affirmation toward Jesus, but it really doesn't matter in our daily experience. We have an affinity toward Jesus. But when it really comes to loving Jesus and following Jesus and knowing Jesus, we have not entered into that experience. And sometimes having not entered into that experience makes it easy to deconstruct that because it is outside of having this personal, loving, ongoing relationship with Jesus, which Paul understands faith to be. Faith is living and dynamic and powerful. It shapes who we are. It shapes our lives. So when we talk about faith, Paul would always say, man cannot save himself. Man is dead. Can't give yourself CPR. But we are saved by God's grace, by God's initiative, by God's mercy. All of those things are absolutely true by faith alone, in grace alone, in Christ alone, amen. But that faith that saves is never alone. It is transformative in our lives. That's the way Paul understands faith. That it is at work, a powerful force at work in our lives. But Paul's concerned that these people, these folks, are deconstructing their faith. Well, what on earth does that mean? Well, we know what to deconstruct means. I, um, uh, Connie and I have an old house, which uh, we love, and uh, the bedroom in which we sleep on the main floor was plaster and lath. And it got to the point to where we would wake up in the morning or sometimes in the middle of the night by plaster falling off the ceiling and hitting us. And so we thought we better do something. So we hired a contractor, and he said, you don't need to spend the money to pay me. You can deconstruct this. I'll reconstruct it. I'm good at deconstruction. I'm terrible at reconstruction. So Aaron, my youngest son, and I, and I don't think the guy's motive was to save money now that I've done deconstruction of plaster and lath. It is a horrific job. It's terrible. The dust and the grime, it is just awful. And the chicken wire, I don't understand chicken wire in the walls, I guess to hold up the plaster. Well, there's a sense in which people are deconstructing, going through this messy process of taking down that which exists. And it can be a bad thing or it can be a good thing. It can be a bad thing. Many of you have read, if you're young enough, You may have read the announcement from a guy named Josh Harris where he said, I am not a Christian. Well, that was shocking. Why was that shocking? Because Josh Harris had written a book that influenced millions of Christians. I kissed dating goodbye. He was the leader of the purity movement. Remember the purity movement in the church? We were uh, having purity uh, classes and purity meetings, and young women were wearing purity rings, and Josh Harris was at the, really the crest of that wave of the purity movement. I kissed dating goodbye. And then he has this slow leak, this deconstruction in his faith. He kissed his wife goodbye, ends up divorcing his wife. He kissed Christianity goodbye. And we've seen this there for a while. We were seeing it, it seemed like every week, a well-known Christian personality was deconstructing their faith to the point to where they walked away from Jesus. And that happens for a variety of reasons. People say it happens to them. 
I'm not, I'm not quite sure. Maybe, could be, but it happens for a variety of reasons. The things we read about, it happening because of the scandals in the church, because Ravi Zacharias turned out to be the kind of man that he was, uh, because of the president of, uh, of, um, of Liberty turned out to be the kind of man he was. And so we see those kind of scandals happen from our own, and it makes us wonder about the reality of the faith, some people at least. Some people left because of the failure of the church to deal with things such as race or poverty. Some people leave because of moral reasons, but some people simply decide objective truth does not exist, and they discard all of it. They simply abandon their faith in totality. I would say to you, that is, if I may use the word, a bad form of deconstruction. I do think there's a good form of deconstruction. I used to restore a lot of antiques, and I don't do that anymore, but taking off all those layers of paint and goo and gunk, putting them back together, gluing and screwing them back together, a good sense of reconstruction. One man I've read says, instead of deconstruction, we should call it disenculturation. I don't even know. It's hard for me to even say the word. Um, Connie and I drove back. She had flown down to Florida, and I went down and picked her up. And on our way back, we're driving back. And I told the first service, Connie and I can have great conversation to champagne. But once you get past champagne, it starts getting a little thin. So we've started listening to books in the car. So on the way back from Florida, you're talking about 1,100, 1,200 miles. We listened to the book, Incidents in the Life of a Slave Girl, that was published in 1861. It was an autobiography of a young woman who grew up in slavery and ultimately escaped and went to New York, Boston, Well, I'm a child of the South. And so when you talk about disenculturation, the thing that is troubling to me, the thing that is about this book is horrifying to me, at least one of the things is how Christians in the South justified slavery. Not only justified it to themselves, but biblically in their minds justified it. So that they had this cultural understanding And people begin to look at that and wonder, wow, how can you biblically justify owning another human being? By the way, she got to New York and Boston and discovered there are many racist people that live there as well. It's just part of the innate sinfulness of humanity. And so some people deconstruct their faith by thinking about the faith in which they grow up, and wondering about some of the belief systems that have been built up around that faith and maybe abandoning those. I'd submit that can be a healthy process. I grew up in the South. It's easy for, at least the South I grew up in, it is easy for Christianity to be part of the culture. Um, We would hot... uh, we would hunt foxes. You would go at night, a bunch of dogs. Yeah, it's kind of barbaric, but we did it. And so one of the things you do to ensure a good fox hunt is before you do the fox hunt, you ask Jesus to protect everybody, especially from Johnny who's been drinking slits since 5 o'clock that afternoon, and keep us safe and help the hunt be successful. If you went to the stock car, I love going to stock car races, dirt track, oval track. I think it was a quarter mile around. And Bubba's racing. What did you do before you started the race? Everybody, please stand and let's what? Pray that Bubba survives the race, doesn't kill somebody or himself. And so Christianity was just simply, and so it would be easy to simply consider yourself a Christian because you're part of that culture. I grew up believing you could not allow alcohol to touch your lips and be a Christian. 
but you could smoke three packs of cools. That's the way it worked. And so as you begin to examine and think about those things, here in the Midwest, we don't deal with some of those things. I'll tell you what I've seen here in the Midwest is we believe laziness sends you to hell, hard work will send you to heaven. Work, 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 work. If you're lazy, woo, baby. Well, we begin to examine and think about our faith, and we begin to disenculturate our faith and abandon those things. And so if your young adult is asking some questions about some of your closely held beliefs, be sure to allow the question to be asked and examined. And it could be they need to abandon some of those ideologies that are merely cultural and not biblical. They don't want to wear a tie to church. Who cares? If they want to wear skinny jeans, we should all care. (laughs) Sorry. Sorry. I'm out of time. When it comes to the idea of apostasy, let me just say a couple of things, and we'll come back to this. I fear that we have taken apostasy out of the Scripture and have so eviscerated it that we have made it to not be a concern for us any longer. We simply, because of our belief in eternal security, have come to the place to where we say, don't worry about that, you could never walk away from your faith. I do believe in eternal security. My sheep listen to my voice, I know them, they follow me, I give them eternal life. They shall never perish. No one will snatch them out of my hand. But I don't believe that does not mean that people can't abandon the faith. Um, When I was a youth pastor in Glenmore, Louisiana, um, there was an old man in that church. I told the first service, I remember thinking he's an old guy. He was my age. And now he was an old man, old man. And I went to see him and talked to him because I was concerned about his salvation. And I was concerned about his salvation because he was profane. Profane man, impure, ungodly, a wretched man. Do you know what his response to me was? How dare you? When I was six, seven, eight years old, I accepted Jesus as my Savior. Now, he had lived a perverse, ungodly life. But he believed, because he had made an affirmation toward Jesus, none of his life, none of his immorality, none of his impurity, none of his degradation counted for anything. I'm here to tell you the Bible warns us, do not walk away from Jesus. And Paul's concerned that these folks here in Thessalonica, that the devil had stolen, had disrupted, had broken their faith. You say, is that something I should worry about? No. Does it mean you fall from grace because you sin or you cuss or you think something you shouldn't think? No. It's about the direction and tangent of your life. Let us not rob the Scripture of its warnings about apostasy either. Stand with me, please. Thank you for your patience. Your faith is not static. It's dynamic. It's growing and changing. Threats to your faith exist. Pray God would protect it. And one of the keys to growing faith is our relationship with others. We'll talk about those things in another message. But as you leave, as you leave this place now, let me pronounce this benediction as you walk out of this place. Now may the Lord of peace himself, Paul wrote in 2 Thessalonians, now may the Lord of peace himself give you peace at all times in every way. May you go and may the Lord be with you all Amen.